Should I start with a story? <laughs> okay, here's my story for today. And I've been told very clear instructions from my wife to preface this story by saying, this is not a story about me. <laughs> Or anyone that I'm connected to, I do not condone these actions. I'm simply the messenger this morning. And if you think I'm trying to be cryptic and say it's actually me, it's not me. It's not me. Okay? It's not me. <laughs> there was a group of people uh, who decided to go camping for a long weekend. It's not me. You're still thinking it. You're still thinking it. They set up their tents, they made a fire, they had dinner together, and then they just spent a lot of time, as we all do camping, socializing and chatting and seeing the stars, uh, but I do not condone, it's not me, it's not me, okay? Some of the people decided it would be better, a better use of their time to stay up all night Maybe a certain beverage was involved, and one of those people, the last one standing, decided in full clear thinking and discernment and wisdom, decided, I know what the best way to start my day, uh, here's the best way to start my day. I should go uh, fishing. So sweet, grabs his fishing rod, grabs his supplies, goes to the shore and is ready to fish and then he gets another even better idea. I bet you I can cast further if I stand in a canoe. Okay? See the logic there, it's pretty good thinking. So this person says, you know what, like, if you've ever tried to stand in one canoe, it's not very stable. I should stand in two canoes. <laughs> two canoes, twice as stable. <laughs> so this person puts both feet in one canoe and kind of steadies themselves, and they've done it. Okay? They are a miraculous, they're like four feet further from the shore. They're going to cast so much further now. Then they brace themselves, and they put the next foot. OK, they're in the second canoe. They grab their fishing rod, and they're ready to cast. But if you know where the story's going, uh, the canoes start to spread a little further, and a little further, and a little further, until they've got one foot and one arm in a canoe, and one foot and one arm in another canoe, and their body is draping into the water below them, and they don't know what to do, so they start yelling and screaming. They're saying, help, I'm going to drown. Someone's got to save me. The whole camp wakes up. They rush out to see this person in two canoes. <laughs> yelling at the top of their lungs, and one of these people says, stand up. And the guy says, no, help, I, I'm going to drown. you got to come in and rescue me. And they say, no, just stand up. And so he takes his arm and his leg out, and his arm and his leg out, and he's in, he's in about a foot of water. <laughs> Luke chapter 6, uh, 46 to 49 says this. It says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they're like. They are like a person building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a person who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. You can see my how this verse and story connect? Not so much yet. It'll make sense. It'll make sense. 
Here's what I was reflecting on this week. Um, often when we look at this passage about two houses, the logical assumption that we make is one house is good things that we do, a person that does good things in life, and a house representing a person that does bad things in life, right? person that does good things, they're going to weather the storm. The person that does bad things, they're not going to weather the storm. That's typically the direction that we go in. But as I've reflected this week, that just seems far too binary to actually describe humans. We're way more complex than that. I, I don't know if, if I have met someone that is 100% good in the good house or 100% bad in the bad house. Um, we are way more complex if that's the understanding of the story that we're taking from it. Do good things and you're the good house. Do bad things and you're the bad house. That just seems way too simplistic. Um, humans, we're, we're complex. We have good and bad. We have triumphs and struggles. We have difficulties and we have accomplishments. We are this complex mixing of, of trauma and upbringing and accomplishments and goals and faith. And it seems too simple for me. There's a, a famous poet, W.H. Auden, and, and I think his poem kind of fits a bit better for me. You shall love your crooked neighbor with your crooked heart. It's a really simple poem, but I think it reflects a little bit better. We have the great and beautiful ability to love, but we're still making mistakes. We're still a little crooked. And our ability to recognize that we are complex should help us love our neighbor who is a little bit crooked because they are also complex. Life isn't binary. We are complicated. Martin Luther would put it this way for Christians. Martin Luther would say, if you're a follower of Jesus, then you are simultaneously a saint and a sinner. You're not a saint or a sinner. You are simultaneously both of those at every moment of your life because we are complicated. Both are true. And so when I looked at the story this week of two houses, and I immediately jumped to the assumption that this is good actions or bad actions, I just don't think that fits. I mean, the, the better way that Jesus could have said that would be, uh, here is a house that is a fixer-upper, you know, it's got a leaky basement and a renovated kitchen. That seems to fit the human experience a little bit better, that we have flaws, that we have good things, that we are complicated, but that's not what he says. Jesus says, there's a house that was dug deep into the rock that has a solid foundation. There's a house that was not built on a foundation. Which one is going to weather the storm? So the challenge that I had this week, what does Jesus mean then? I don't, I'm not convinced anymore that Jesus is just talking about good actions and bad actions. I, I think this actually um, is describing something far more helpful. I think these two homes represent uh, two possible lenses that we can look at the world through. The framework that we use to understand the world around us and our place in it because, uh, this is in Luke chapter 6, if you read the rest of Luke chapter 6, Jesus has just spent all of this time uh, sharing a, a massive speech that some would call the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plains, the Beatitudes. Uh, there are many names for it, but Jesus describes there is a new and better way to look at the world around us. Yes, he gives examples of how to act, but I think more crucial for Jesus, Jesus isn't saying, here's a list of things to do and things not to do. Jesus is saying, we are looking at the world totally wrong. Let's shift our perspective. Let's look at it differently. 
And here's what will happen. Here are the actions we will do when we start looking at it that way. It's a new perspective. It's it's a new lens for us to perceive the world. Here's some of the things Jesus says. Blessed are the poor, for you will live in God's family. It's not an action. That is looking at people who are struggling differently. Blessed are those who hunger, for you will be satisfied. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. If you love only those who love you in return, doesn't everybody do that? Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. A lot of these are actions, and all of them have action steps, but I think if we jump right away to here is the list that Jesus is making of do these things and don't do these things, I I think we're missing the thread between all of it. Jesus isn't calling us to memorize a rule book. He's calling us to look at the world differently. And when we start to look at the world differently, then we start to understand how certain actions fit into that lens and certain actions just don't fit. It's a new way to look at the world. For for Jesus in Luke chapter 6, society is flipped on its head. The poor are valuable, the outcasts are accepted, the first will be last. That's not about actions. That is saying this is the lens that you are used to. This is the hierarchy that we have in society. There's a new way to look at it. Let's flip that on its head. That love, generosity, and forgiveness will always be better than hate and greed and vengeance. And despite our human instinct to judge and to criticize uh, this new lens that Jesus offers to us is a challenge. Instead of looking for judgment and criticism, we can look for curiosity, common ground, uh, not critique. And so Jesus offers this new way of looking. And so for me, as as I continue to um, explore my faith, as I continue to try to grow deeper in my faith, um, my goal is not how do I memorize as many rules as possible. Um, I think that's actually really harmful. You can always manipulate rules in your benefit, right? The rule says this, if I just tweak it a little bit, I still get to be the beneficiary of that situation. But if I start to challenge myself to say, actually, I think Jesus is calling me to look at everything in this world, including myself, through the lens of Christ, okay, That changes things for me. That's exciting. That means I have opportunity to to grow, to look at things in a new way, to release things that have been burdening me in my past, to introduce more love, not not to continue to hate and continue to have anger and try to add love into that, but say there's no hate or anger in my lens anymore. There's a a lot of love and grace and mercy in this perspective. That's how I'm going to look at the world in front of me. As I was preparing and thinking about this, uh, I mean, God's timing is always really funny. Um, Every other Monday, a small group of young dads, we we get together as a small group. And sometimes it's Bible study. Sometimes it's just supporting one another. And and this week we... um, we were talking about a lot of different topics. Um, one of the people that is going uh, did some helpful teaching on confirmation bias and negativity bias. Confirmation bias is our tendency to um, see the world uh, in ways that we already think are true. 
That's confirmation bias, right? I have these beliefs about it, therefore I'm going to notice the things that I believe. I mean, I, I think, I, I don't know, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, right? Troy did the exercise, look for brown things, and how many you can name a red thing? That's confirmation bias. Negativity bias, I had never heard of before, so this, this has been an exciting week. Negativity bias is the natural biological instinct that we have as humans in our brain to give negative situations more weight. Right, it's why we can go to an amusement park, we can have an awesome time, we can eat all of the amazing things. I think the example this person at small group gave was you go on the rides, you eat the funnel cake, you have a blast with your friends, and then you throw up in the car on the way home. <laughs> and what, do you, what, what is your um, memory of that day? Horrible day, <laughs> awful day. I will never go to an amusement park again because 1% of the day was negative. We got talking uh, in that group a bit about, about how do we uh, look at this in our marriages and the understanding that if you are assuming negativity about another person, you are going to see negativity, negativity bias. If the lens that you look at the world through is one of negativity, then you are going to see a world that is negative. But if you combat that by seeing as many positives as you can in your partner, in your family, in your neighbors, in the world, then you start to see all the positives. You start to be grateful. It is not, okay, how do I have this lens of negativity and how do I have this lens of positivity? It is something far better than that, I, I think is what Jesus is trying to say to us. Because when I look at this story of the two houses, and if I get rid of the idea that it is just about our actions, and actually it's the lens that we choose to look at the world through, um, here's what I think we tend to do. Jesus says, hey everyone, there's a Christ lens. You can look at the world and see positivity, you can see hope, you can see grace and mercy and compassion, society getting flipped on its head, uh, marginalized people being cared for, the poor being accepted, all of these amazing things, or you can stick with your default lens, where it's you-centric, where it's negativity-centric, where it's survival-centric. And when Jesus offers us those two houses, we say yes to both. You know what I mean? We, we, we typically say yes to both of those options because in some moments, this one gives me some benefits and in other moments, this one gives me benefits. Um, as much as I don't like to admit it, right, there are moments where I feel like, hmm, I mean, to be peaceful in that situation to give mercy, to give forgiveness, I actually think I would benefit a little bit more if I just chose anger or frustration or, or greed. And so we start to pick and choose. This is where the Christ lens benefits me. This is where my default lens benefits me. With negativity bias, Here's a week where negativity bias is going to benefit me. Here's moments when positive bias is going to benefit me. And instead of, we, I, I, I'll, I'll stop that thought. Instead of picking one, we say, how can I have the best of both worlds? Which one gives me the most benefit in this situation? Which one can I set aside for a moment? And you start living in two worlds. Back to my story about canoes. We automatically assume more options are going to give us more stability. Right? I want to get further ahead 
So here's the benefit from this lens, and here's the benefit from this lens. I'm going to pick and choose so that I can get further ahead, so that I can get more benefits, so that I can receive more. And I think it actually does the opposite. Standing in two canoes doesn't make you two times as stable. It makes you two times more likely to feel like you're drowning. And I think that's true of our lenses. When I say I'm feeling firmly convinced that the way of Jesus is for me, and I start living into that, there's a choice. When I choose to live in my default, there's a choice. But when I start bouncing between them, I don't mean making mistakes. I'm not trying to say one is perfect and one is not perfect. That's not the point of this, right? It's not about the houses aren't actions. But when I start to see different options, I think I just start feeling like both of them aren't cutting it. You know what I mean? I, I, I wasn't going to tell this story, but I remember talking to a friend of mine uh, who, who's a pastor, and he was saying, um, I love being a pastor, but I, I struggle that all of my friends get to keep climbing the corporate ladder and therefore get, keep getting to make more money. Why can't I have both of these? And he left ministry. And he wasn't happy at the new job he got. Because he wanted both. Can I get the benefits of both? And as much as that's a silly example and far more, I mean, it's complicated. We need to unpack that a little more another time. The point is, well, actually, I think Jesus says it, says it best. Matthew 6 says, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will hate that one and love this one. Or I actually wonder if you start to hate both. When I start living in the Christ lens and including other lenses, I think we start to feel like, man, this Jesus thing is just not cutting it. I'm not really seeing the benefits. How come I'm not feeling that peace that Jesus offered to me? You know, how come I'm not feeling more calm? And, and when I think about my own life, I'll let you think about yours, I think it's because I'm not actually living in it. I, I think it's I'm stepping in and I'm stepping out and I've got one foot in this house and one foot in this house and when I have negativity and positivity and anger and peace, um, both of them aren't cutting it. I don't have enough anger to get my way and I don't have enough peace to feel calm, both are just kind of lacking. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. So as I uh, often, when I think about sermons, I like to go for a drive. As I was thinking and driving this week, it started to make me reflect on what does my Christ lens actually look like? When I'm living in that house that's built on a firm foundation, what does that actually look like? And does that, rather than trying to live in my default and add Christ to it, what do I need to get rid of so that I'm truly living in that one house? Which is challenging. But I think it's going to be far more valuable and far more successful if rather than saying, I want a little bit of peace and a little bit of anger and a little bit of judgment and a little bit of this, where none of it feels like enough, I'm... I'm going to choose forgiveness. That's how I'm going to live in every situation. That is the house I'm building my foundation on. And when I get to a moment where now something is pressing up against that lens that says, are you going to be forgiving? If I've got one foot, not one foot, if I have both feet in that canoe, 
then there's no other option than to be forgiving. If I have both feet in the canoe of positive bias, then there's no other option than to be positively looking at my partner and my family and my neighbors. I think the tricky part is when we start to put our feet in two canoes. Let me read one last verse before I close. Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and you will learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We really like the part about rest. Come to me if you're feeling tired and overburdened, and I will give you rest is a great, great truth as we're busy and as life is difficult. But another way you could say this verse is we're going to attach our necks together with a piece of wood. That's what a yoke is. And we're going to do life together. Now, I'm not an avid farmer. Can you say avid farmer? Is that a thing? Greg? Greg says yes. Okay, Greg says yes. <laughs> but if you're attached by a yoke, um, where one animal looks, the other animal is also looking. Where one animal is moving, the other one is moving. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. When we are connecting ourselves to the Christ lens, that's the direction we're going in. There are two houses. One house built in the foundation, deep in the rock. When the storm comes, it doesn't get destroyed. There's another house that has no foundation, and when that storm comes, it is destroyed. One lens is my goal for myself this week.